still out. All right, guys, welcome. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet today on the land of the Ghana people and we expect uh, their elders past, present, and emerging. Now, this is a really, really heated topic for our union. It's one of the most important things we stand for. What happens when the private sector cannot create enough jobs for everyone? Well, we believe that it's the role of the government to step in and create those jobs when there are enough jobs. And a job guarantee is one of the key things we can do uh, as a union is to get ideas about it and get it pushed out so we can hopefully put pressure to get into, into place to fight against the rampage for neoliberalism that we've all been living under. Now, Stephen Hale is a, quite a remarkable individual. He's a lecturer at the University of Adelaide. That's where I study. Um, he is a modern monetary theorist, an advocate for voluntary and equitable job guarantee. He published a book, Economics, uh, Economics for Sustainable Prosperity, last year, and is a research scholar at the Global Institute for Sustainable Prosperity. He has recently been a spokesperson for GetUp's Future to Fight For. Yeah, that's right, give it a clap. And a consultant for the group uh, called Real Progressives in the USA. There we are. Where he is a supporter of Bernie Sanders. Good on him. He is organizing an event on Monday, March the 4th at the university called Really Ending Poverty and he hopes he can all attend. So, put your hands together and please welcome Stephen Harris. Well, thanks very much. Thanks, Alex. Um, thanks very much for coming to everybody. I'm amazed that you want to come and listen to me talk about economics on a Friday evening. But I'm very grateful um, that you come along. Um, yes, I want to talk about um, how we could deliver full employment having a job guarantee, job guarantee scheme in Australia. And I also want to talk about um, how we could go about paying for it and a variety of related issues as well. Of course we've got a federal election coming up. And I, as much as anything else this evening, I want to get over the idea that unemployment, which we've had to a varying extent at a significant level since the mid-1970s, since 1975, but which was virtually non-existent in Australia between 1945 and 1975, has been a political choice, not an economic necessity. And growing inequality has been another political choice. We had a very low level of inequality of income and wealth in this country between 1945 and 1975. You might say the Scandinavian level of inequality. They still have a Scandinavian level of inequality in Scandinavia. We don't. That's been a political choice, not an economic necessity. Australia in the 1970s, and actually even in the early 1990s, had very little household debt and relatively affordable housing. We now have the world's second highest level of household debt. That's been a political choice too, and we could choose Differently, we could eliminate involuntary unemployment, underemployment, and insecure employment. We could, over time, greatly reduce the level of inequality of both income and wealth in Australia, and we ought to be acting over time to make housing more affordable and to move away from a reliance on household debt and a property bubble as a way of trying to drive our economy forward. If I could take you back in time, uh, about 80 years, from the mid-1930s, uh, John Maynard Keynes wrote that famous book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest and Money, that was uh, published in this month, in January 1936. And the final chapter of that book, he started off by I'm using these words, the outstanding faults of the economic society in which we live are its failure to provide full employment and its arbitrary and inequitable distribution of wealth and incomes. Kate was talking about the fact that capitalism, left to its own devices, fails to provide full employment over time and left to its own devices generates an inequitable 
distribution of income and wealth, as was the case in the UK where he was writing and around the world in the mid-1930s, as was not the case during that first 30-year period after the Second World War. There was a great decrease in the degree of inequality in this country and others during the Second World War, and the level of inequality continued to fall more gradually up until the early 1970s. Full employment was delivered during wartime in this country, but it was maintained for 30 years after the Second World War. And then, of course, uh, we had the um, explosion in oil prices. We had the energy crisis in the mid-1970s. And a spike, a temporary spike in inflation. And the right, the people that we now call neoliberals, took advantage of that. They took over the majority of the economics profession. They took over um, economic institutions around the world, policy institutions. They took over academic institutions as far as economics was concerned. They took over conservative parties worldwide and they intimidated Labour parties or parties of the left. They convinced everyone that full employment was no longer possible anymore. They even redefined what full employment was so that suddenly full employment was not a situation where everybody who wanted a job could find one, but full employment was unemployment of five or six or seven, or sometimes they even defined full employment as eight percent unemployment. And they persuaded everybody, including Labour Prime Ministers in Australia and elsewhere, that what was necessary in order for the economy to grow over time and to be prosperous was to incentivise the rich by cutting marginal tax rates and to incentivise the poor by cutting welfare payments and making them conditional and framing unemployment as though it was a problem with the unemployed rather than a problem with the economy and with a lack of demand for their labour. And really it's not until very recently that we've had any politicians come to the fore around the world who've been prepared to take this on. Those are Bernie's words. I want you to think big, not small. Those would be my words to Bill Shaw. I want you to think big, not small. I want you to deliver full employment. I want you to regain a Scandinavian level of inequality in this country. Not overnight, but I want you to move in that direction, credibly. Now, I don't want to talk about this chart for very long. On the left-hand side, we've got a measure, a standard measure of inequality. And you can see, can't you? This goes back to the mid-1970s. If we went back further, Australia would have had essentially the same level of inequality as countries like Denmark back in the 1960s. Now, inequality in this country is in the top half of the OECD countries. We are a more unequal country than the average amongst the rich countries. We've basically got the same level of inequality as the UK does now. We used to be a much more equal place than the UK. We need to move that down. As far as household debt is concerned, well, I'm only going to go back to the early 90s to show you a period of time when there wasn't much household debt in Australia. But remember what I said about those neoliberals taking over economics, taking over politics, intimidating the left and basically backing up the right. Well, household debt, during the period of time when that gentleman, Peter Costello, was the treasurer of this country, trebled relative to the size of our economy. We went from having a much lower level of household debt than the UK, Japan, or the USA to having well, roughly twice as much household debt as Japan has. Yeah. Japan is a country which has run large government deficits, fiscal deficits during the years. Australia is a country which during the 90s and 2000s ran government surpluses. And people on the left tended to complain, if anything, that those surpluses were not big enough. Completely wrong. Completely wrong. A government surplus means a private deficit. In the case of Australia, that private deficit meant an economy built on a housing bubble and on household borrowing, so that we now have the second highest level of household debt in the world. We need to get that down. We need to rethink the way that um, we think about government finances and the role of the government budget in our economy. And as far as unemployment is concerned, now I, I put that picture of the Beatles 
in Adelaide Town Hall in 1964 down the field is in the audience who's convinced he's Paul McCartney's love child. <laughs> may or may not be true, you can take a look at it later and see whether you can see any, any uh, um, similarities. But look, you can see uh, what the <coughs> rate of unemployment in Australia was. M many orthodox economists, particularly younger ones, people under the age of 40, they don't even, they're unaware of this and they don't believe it when you tell them. You actually have to show them the statistics. Um, the Menzies government nearly lost an election in the early 60s because unemployment went a bit above 2%. Basically, everybody who wanted a job during the 1950s and 1960s could have a job because the government ensured that that was the case. There was basically an informal job guarantee in Australia in those days. You could uh, turn up and get a job in a park or rail yards if you were unemployed. You, you'd get a job in those days. There were more jobs available, but there were people looking for them. Who was in power? Was it some lefty communist interventionist? No, it was Robert Menzies who was in power in Australia almost the whole of that time. And did they talk a lot about returning to surplus? There was a tiny government budget surplus in 1950. There were none other across those two decades in Australia. People didn't talk in those terms, in those days. If we update things a little bit, okay, there's a small jump. Unemployment basically jumped up in 1975. In Australia, it jumped up about 5%, and if you look at the official figure for unemployment, it's got the most recent one is over there on the right-hand side, it's 5.1%, it's a little bit lower now than it was then. But, of course, the nature of the labour market has changed. As you might be aware, you don't count as unemployed if you've even got one hour of paid employment in a week. There was virtually no underemployment in the 1960s. There's a loss of it now. It was beginning to become significant in 1978. It was 2.6% of the labour force. It's now, what, more than three times that amount. And the figure to compare with that 1% to 2% unemployment of the 1950s and 60s in Australia, if we want to make a comparison, is really the underutilisation rate, which includes people who are unemployed and also people who are underemployed. And maybe even that's too low, because it excludes groups that ought to be classified as unemployed but are not in the official statistics. We are far away from full employment in Australia at the moment. And if you're 15 to 24 years old, the situation is even worse as far as you're concerned. Our underutilisation rate for people in that age bracket is about 30%, and in some areas of this state, it's above 50%. There's a better than 50% chance if you're in the labour force and you're aged between 15 and 24 that you're either going to be unemployed or you're not going to have as many hours of employment as you need. And what do I mean by saying that this in part reflects the left being misled and intimidated. Well, where's the big jump in the underutilisation rate during these years? It's when Paul Keating was the treasurer. It's not when Peter Costello was the treasurer. It's both sides of politics in Australia and many other countries around the world down the years that have tolerated that increase in inequality and the increase in unemployment and underemployment. And why? Well, the people who for political uh, reasons, not for reasons to do with uh, genuine uh, evidence, empirical evidence, took over the economics profession in the 1970s, Milton Friedman and those people who followed him, who ended up, remember, intimidating both sides of politics, rigged the game. That's what uh, uh, an economist from the other side called Hyman Minsky, one or two you might have heard of Hyman Minsky, said in a book that he wrote in 1986, the game of policy making is rigged. It's very difficult to talk to people like uh, Bill Shorten. Or Richard Di Natale, let's not pick on just one party, and persuade them to think about ideas like a job guarantee because they believe the economy is already at full employment. What? 
or they believe that if you're unemployed, it's a problem with you. They think that you have to be better educated and trained, or you won't be employable in the modern economy, or sometimes, not those two gentlemen, but some people uh, nominally on the left, they think that you need to be better incentivized, it needs to be more difficult for you to claim new start or some other form of income support. They've been fooled by the theory of their intellectuals. And as a colleague of Phil and mine, Warren Mosler, has put it, the biggest problem on the progressive side of politics is that people have forgotten how the monetary system has always worked and they don't understand how the modern monetary system, the financial system that we now live with, we don't have to introduce this, it's already in place, they don't understand how it works. Consequently, you get conversations like this. You can just imagine it, can't you? The next election is coming up, and 7.30 is on, and the politician is there being interviewed, and the interviewer says, yeah, it's fine, you want to introduce all these programmes, you want to raise new stock, maybe, you want to introduce a job guarantee. Do you accept the government can only spend what it earns? How are you going to raise the money to pay? For these things. And we could be talking about investments to deal with trying to limit climate change. How are we going to pay for these things? Now, these words actually I used when I last did a talk in this very room four and a half years ago because I had heard a politician from the Australian Greens on news radio that very morning use exactly these words with another interviewer, not with not with this one, but it's a typical, it's the typical response. Of course. I accept the government can only spend on the Any time you hear a politician say that, in a country like Australia, with Australia's monetary system, it means they don't understand the monetary system. Which means basically they don't understand anything as far as the role of the government's budget is concerned. The government doesn't earn anything. Not really. Taxes are not what the government earns. Taxes simply involve, when we're talking about federal taxation anyway, deleting dollars from the money supply. That's what taxes do, they destroy dollars. That's what they're there for. We can't have too many dollars. They'd be spending beyond the productive capacity of the economy and there'd be rising inflation, so we have to delete some. That's the job of taxes. Taxes have other jobs, of course, as we know, to redistribute income and wealth, to encourage some behaviours and discourage others. But at a macroeconomic level, that's what taxes are there for. Taxes are not there to pay for what the government spends. Our government is a currency issuer. Every dollar it spends is a new dollar, a dollar that's been bought. When the government spends money in Australia, the Reserve Bank of Australia credits private sector bank accounts and the money supply increases. That's what happens. The government can't run out of Australian dollars. The government invented the Australian dollar. It's the sole manufacturer of the currency, whether we're talking about little bits of plastic or whether we're talking about numbers on a spreadsheet, only the Australian government via the Reserve Bank of Australia is allowed to create Australian dollars in that way. If you want to ask me later about banks creating money, you can. But that's something, something slightly different. So this politician, well, she was using, it was a she on that occasion, she was using the wrong language. She was using the enemy's language, actually, the other side's language, that's always a mistake. And buying into the wrong metaphor, that neoliberal metaphor of the government as a household. The government isn't a household. Your household has nothing in common with the government as far as finances are concerned, at least unless you've got a machine in your kitchen which can counterfeit money. Anyway, if that's not the case, you're not in the same position as them. The Australian government, it could spend too much and create inflation. It could undermine confidence in our currency, of course it could, it could do all those things. But the one thing it can't do is run out of Australian dollars. So the government can't just spend what it earns. Even if you want to think about the government as earning from taxation, and that's not the role of taxation anyway, the amount the government spends does not have to equal the amount it raises in taxation. And indeed, what did I say during the Menzies government, during the 1950s and 1960s? 
they almost never did. And across the whole history of the Australian Commonwealth, about 85% of the time the Australian government budget has been in deficit, and that's been a good thing, because that government deficit is a non-government or a private surplus. So you shouldn't be in entering into this kind of discussion at all. How does the government pay for a job guarantee or for anything else it wants to do by crediting private sector bank accounts? That's how. Where do the dollars come from? They come from nowhere. They're just electronic items on a spreadsheet, that's all. What's the role of taxation? If there's too many dollars on those spreadsheets, there'll be too much spending, it will be inflationary. It's the role of taxation to delete some of those dollars to stop <coughs> that happening. This is the way our monetary system works. Or to put it another way, very briefly, um, this is from a, a, the cartoons by an architect who is also a modern monetary theory economist called J.D. Alt. And I like talking about these pictures because sometimes pictures help people understand what you're talking about. Now, I guarantee that the majority of politicians in Canberra think our monetary system works like the box on the left-hand side of this slide. And so do most journalists. And so do a lot of people. They just think it's common sense. It must work this way because it's kind of like their own budget in a way. They think the federal government swallows up a lot of money. Where does it get this money from? Well, it gets quite a lot of the money from the private sector. The private sector doesn't have very much money, and the government's bleeding it dry with all these taxes. <laughs> on top of that, the government borrows from the private sector too, pays interest on that debt, and the government borrows even more from China because obviously if you want Australian dollars that only the Australian government is allowed to manufacture, you'd get them from China, wouldn't it? It stands to reason. Well, let's not be... I don't want to... Um, is facetious the right word? It's understandable that people think this way because they're surrounded by this narrative the whole time. Then, of course, that leads you to think of the government as wasting all this money on entitlements, money going to dull brothers, wasting some in all sorts of other imaginative discretionary ways, like paying people like me to teach you how to go <laughs> Some of it, they've got to repay to China, they borrow that money, you've got to pay it back. And they have to pay interest as well. And the implication here is that the government, just like you, could become insolvent, it could go bust as long as our government doesn't borrow in foreign currency, that could never happen in Australia. The true story is on the right hand side. The federal government is the, at the top. It has limited its potential supply of Australian dollars. After all, most of them are printed, they're just electronic items, so you've just got to be able to type it on a keyboard. That's as difficult as it is to create Australian dollars. These Australian dollars are spent into circulation and of course that allows the government to create those collective goods and services, public goods and services which provide our um, social and economic infrastructure and support those businesses which employ a lot of people in the private sector and generate profits. That's where the money comes from. Now, like we were saying before, you better have some taxes there, otherwise there'd be too much spending in the economy and there'd be inflation. And sure, you could, I suppose, turn Australia into a sort of Zimbabwe case if you tried hard enough. Actually, in Zimbabwe, the biggest problem was a collapse of the supply side of the economy. Not initially too much demand, but you can create hyperinflation. Of course you can, because you could create a limitless number of Australian dollars and you can't create a limitless number of goods and services to buy with those Australian dollars. So we need taxes in order to reduce the ability of the private sector to spend, to create room within the productive capacity of the economy for the government to spend. Why does the government need to issue treasury bonds? Well, they don't, really. To an extent, government debt securities are an anachronism. 
They're something which in the old days of the gold standard in Australia, pre-1983 fixed exchange rates might have been essential, but are not absolutely essential now. They do provide superannuation fund managers with a safe asset that pays a nice rate of interest to support some people in their old age. They also play one other useful function in our financial system, which I won't go into now, unless somebody wants to ask me. They make it a bit easier for the Reserve Bank to control interest rates than if these bonds were not issued at all. But they don't really destroy money. And really when the government sells treasury bonds to the private sector, that involves the private sector giving up some cash, or you might say giving up a, a current account, a transaction account at the Reserve Bank, and swapping it for a savings account or a term deposit at the Reserve Bank. Because that's all government bonds are. They're just transferable savings accounts at the Reserve Bank of Australia. Just like the government's not going to run out of Australian dollars, neither is the Reserve Bank. And interest payments, how much of our taxes are going to fund those interest payments to bondholders? Nothing. Those interest payments are new dollars, just like government spending is new dollars. And it might seem, uh, um, again, uh, maybe I almost sound facetious, but I'm only telling you the truth. This is the way the monetary system works. So, put brief. Randall Ray is one of the four leading modern monetary theorists around the world. One of the big four is an Australian. I'll talk, tell you about him in a, in a moment. But Randall Ray is an American, uh, and this is the sort of thing he would say, or he would say, absolutely correct. Every dollar the federal government spends, not the state government, but the federal government, the state government's like you and me, they can make. Every dollar the federal government spends is a new dollar. Every dollar of taxation destroys a dollar. Every dollar of bond issuance doesn't exactly destroy a dollar, it just changes the form of it, from a transaction account to a savings account. Your government, our government, I should say, can never run out of dollars. Our government invented the dollar and manufactures it and is a monopoly manufacturer of it. Taxes are there to prevent inflation. They are not there to pay for anything. There's the Aussie modern monetary theory. It's Bill Mitchell, you should follow his blog if you're interested in economics and if you're interested in ideas like the job guarantee, he has as good a claim as anybody to be the modern day inventor of the job guarantee. Billy Block, that's the name of Bill's blog. Well, Bill, like any other competent economist, knows these things. Our federal government has, this is literally true, no purely financial constraints. <coughs> Our economy, like any economy, has what we sometimes call real constraints. We have to live within our ecological limits. We also have limited amounts of labour and skills and capital equipment and technology and business organisations and natural resources. So we have a limited productive capacity, and if we spend too much, the government and the private sector together, it's not only government spending that can cause inflation, it creates a risk of inflation, and that's really the primary macroeconomic function of taxation in order to limit that risk. Moreover, and I mentioned this before when I talked about Peter Costello and rising household debt, if you want the private sector to save over time, to be in surplus, then the government sector has to be in deficit. And every single year, most governments in the world are in deficit. And almost all governments in the world, there's a few exceptions, countries with small populations and big persistent trade surpluses like Norway, but almost all governments, for the great majority of the time, that they've existed and been currency issuers have been in deficit. So I was talking about Australia 85% of the time, something like that. In the US it's more than 90% of the time. And in countries like that, when governments run surpluses, the private sector goes into deficit. You either get a recession because you're weakening private sector 
balance sheet. You're taking more off the private sector than you're giving them. Why would anybody want that from the government unless it was essential? Why, why, why would you want a budget surplus? They're taking more money away from you than they're giving to you. That's the definition of a government surplus. And it's not like a business making a profit. Nothing to do with it. Um, anyway, let's, let's go on. Now, just to simplify, I've forgotten about the rest of the world for a moment. So I've got the government balance here, based on Australian Bureau of Statistics data on the flow of funds, government uh, net lending to or net borrowing from uh, the rest of our monetary system. On this chart, going back to the early 1990s, what can you see about these two lines? Slide to the right bit. They are mirror images of each other. Of course they're mirror images of each other because for one half of our monetary system to be in deficit, the other half has to be in surplus. If you could imagine that uh, uh, you and I were the only <coughs> two individuals living in our economy, maybe you can call me the government and you the private sector if you like. If you're the private sector and you want to save the currency I issue over time, you saving means you're spending less than you earn. But your income is somebody else's spending. So for you to spend less than you earn and save, if you want to think about me as earning and spending as well, I would have to spend more than I earn. I would have to deficit spend for you to save. That's the way the system works. So dollar for dollar, a government surplus, and we saw the government budget go in and out of surplus in the late 90s and early 2000s, a government surplus is a non-government deficit. It weakens everybody else's balance sheets. A government deficit helps to support the economy and helps the private sector strengthen its collective balance sheet. It helps the economy to grow without relying on growing household debt. If we do put the rest of the world in, because in fact we really ought to look at at least three sectors, you'll see that the foreign sector, as far as Australia is concerned, ever since, well not just since the early 90s, this goes back to 1974, has always been above the horizontal axis here. That means Australia, when you look at something called our current account balance, which is the best measure of our trade balance used for this purpose, has always been in deficit, and still is, all the way back to 1974. And yet, we have not borrowed in foreign currency. Our debt in net dollar terms. So what does this mean? It means that for 40 odd years, the rest of the world has wanted to save Australian dollars. So they sold us more than they bought from us, and they pocketed the balance in Australian dollars. We don't have foreign currency denominated debt to the rest of the world overall. What does that mean as far as the rest of us are concerned? Well, it's usually seen, and historically this has been the case, as a good thing for the private sector to be in small surplus. Building up its net savings of Australian dollars gradually over time. Not to be in big deficit because, well, uh, that could be supported if we're talking about an investment boom like a mining boom, but most of the time in Australia when it was happening, it wasn't mining companies that were doing the borrowing, it was households. So what allowed the Australian government to run surpluses in all those years? It was growing household debt. Even now, the Labour Party doesn't feel comfortable talking about fiscal policy during the John Howard years. And they should. They don't feel comfortable because they've been conned. They've been conned into believing that fiscal surpluses are good for stability. I mean, you're setting money aside so that it's there if you need it, if there's a downturn. You're not doing that at all. A fiscal surplus just means you're destroying dollars. You're not saving anything. That concept is meaningless. You issue the currency. Um, so what was happening during the surplus years? Well, Mr. Howard was um, boasting about his surpluses, and meanwhile, households were going far into debt and our property bubble was inflated, which is a problem we still have to deal with now. It was, in other words, the opposite of a responsible um, fiscal policy. Um, 
these three balances, the rest of the world balance with us. We're in deficit with them, they're in surplus with us. That's why that red line is above the horizontal. The private sector balance, if it's above the horizontal, the private sector is net saving, it's below, it's net borrowing. And the government balance, which speaks for itself, really. We know there's still a deficit, but they're boasting about the fact that they'll soon be back in surplus. Okay. And if we want our economy to be at full employment, our government can, yes, potentially can influence our economic relations with the rest of the world, but cannot determine our current account balance. If the rest of the world wants to net save in Australian dollars, that's what will happen. Our government can influence um, household decisions and private sector decisions generally, incorporating uh, uh, businesses as well and financial institutions in terms of uh, 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 saving or borrowing, but can't determine. What that means is that for our economy at any point in time to be uh, at the full employment level of spending, the government balance has to be allowed to float because it's determined largely by the other two, by decisions taken outside the government sector. You can see that by what happened when the global financial crisis struck. The private sector <coughs> went from net borrowing a lot to being extremely cautious and running surpluses going above the horizontal line. Consequently, what had to happen to the government budget? It had to go from a small <coughs> surplus to quite a big deficit very, very quickly. Now, about half of that was deliberate. It was Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan correctly supporting the economy, preventing a deep recession from happening. But the other half was just automatic. It's just the way the economy works. If our economy slows down, tax receipts fall, unemployment starts edging up, the government budget will automatically move towards deficit, whatever else happens. I just wanted you to be absolutely certain I'm not lying. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from, uh, well, I, I didn't take it directly from Fugo Capital, it comes from a uh, a report by an organisation called Per Capital. They took it from Philo Capital. You've got, don't worry about the bottom half, you've got the government budget balance going back to federation across the top half of this slide. And all the deficits are in red and all the surpluses are in green. See what I mean? Your household, if you could imagine your household still going, which it started in 1900, uh, your household couldn't borrow all those years, year after year after year after year after year, and never run a surplus, never pay it back. Uh, the Australian government, of course, can. It could even, under our previous monetary systems, it's even more obviously the case under our monetary system. And of course, after we were so heavily indebted during the Second World War, you think, oh my God, all that debt, everything's going to collapse around our ears. Well, what happened after the Second World War? All the public services that were laid on later were provided by a government you might imagine was bankrupt. It should suggest that um, the way the government budget works has been misrepresented. Here is another leading modern monetary theorist who's coming to Adelaide later in the year. She's going to do one of the big uh, showpiece lectures at the university in <coughs> September, or October. Stephanie Kelton, Bernie Sanders, Chief Economics Advisor. Really excited because it's going to be right in the middle of the primary campaign. Um, so these kinds of things, government deficits are normal. I've just showed you that. And necessary. How are you going to save? non-existent Australian dollars. If, if you're saving dollars, then either somebody else in the private sector has borrowed them into existence, but they've been spent into existence by the government. Actually, the second of those things is normally better than the first. So, decide what needs fixing. Have a mission-oriented approach to the government budget and fiscal policy. What do we need to do? These are the things we need to do. We need to fix inequality and unemployment and climate change and other things too. If the real resources exist, if there are people out there to do the work, if there are materials, if there is equipment out there to do the work, if you have the natural resources, you can pay for them, of course you can. 
you're the currency issuing federal government. Better still, if Gina Reinhardt doesn't like it, tell her to go and live somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> because her taxes don't, don't pay for anything. And actually, if all she's doing is digging stuff out from under the ground in Australia, she can't take that stuff with her either. I would say she can take her business with her. Not really. Rich people's taxes don't pay for anything. We have to tax rich people because they've got too much money, too much power, too much command over real resources, and maybe they'll spend too much and contribute towards inflation. We don't need to tax them to get their money. Actually, what they've got is the government's money. It doesn't have Gina Reinhardt's face on a $50 note. Not to pick on her, I could pick on somebody else. I was rich, I can't think of too many other people. There's, a, there's no need to issue government securities, but if you think they're useful, if fund managers like them, then fine, keep doing it if you want. The bond market cannot dictate to an Australian government. Taxes are there to limit total spending, they don't pay for government spending, and if on 7.30 you get asked how are you going to pay for this job guarantee that I'm about to spend a few minutes talking about, you just say the Reserve Bank will pay for it. We we'll just credit the private bank accounts. We've already done our statistical analysis, but based on the current state of the economy, we don't think this amount of spending is going to be inflationary. So we don't have to take it. And we can pay for it because it says we not. We're just going to create the balances in bank accounts as we go along. If it would be inflationary, then you'd need an offset. But if it's not going to be inflation, if you've got the capacity there, then it doesn't. The government's not going to run out of dollars. So, here we go. Well, there's lots of things we'd like to do. This is from the Get Up site, from their Future Defiant Fight For campaign. I was hoping Gabby would come. There's a picture of Gabby in the bottom right-hand corner in the middle. A little bit out of focus, but not the new upload action group. Um, what does Stephanie say? Balance the economy, not the budget. Balancing the economy really ought to be, ought to involve reducing the degree of inequality because we're way out of balance. It should involve reducing over time the level of household debt. And that involves looking at things like household, housing, housing affordability and the way the financial system is, is regulated. But it's certainly not in balance. Really. The situation as it stands at the moment is not sustainable in the long run. Right. And balancing the economy, it should involve getting rid of insecure employment and underemployment and providing people who want to with the opportunity to do socially valuable, fairly paid uh, work in a government run and funded job. Guarantee that option should be there for us all. People shall, should have a right, unless or until they abuse that right, to employment. And there's uh, Stephanie in in Sydney a few months ago talking about this, and uh, she's got Bernie's picture. And why would you tax the rich? I was just telling you. Why not? Because you need their money. Now, amongst all these measures, there's lots of other things we've done. I'm not going to talk about any of them at the moment because there's not time, but the number one is a job guarantee. Well paid work for all who want. So, if I was to become Prime Minister through some administrative way, <laughs> I might get Pavlina Geneva to come over and give me some advice. She's another leading modern monetary there is to, along with Bill, has done a lot of the work when it comes to operationalising what a job guarantee would actually mean. A job guarantee would be federally funded. It would be costed per job, but the number of people, the quantity of people in the job guarantee would float. So the total spending on the job guarantee would float. Well, I suppose in that sense, it's kind of a tiny bit like New Star. We might spend on that float. I don't want to talk about new stuff because there's nothing other than that in common with it. A job guarantee should meet local needs. Now, there should be a basic minimum job guarantee service which has to be available everywhere 
but in different local communities around the country, there'll be variations on that. The job guarantee in a remote community will not be the same as it would be in the middle of Melbourne. There'll be different people will be doing different jobs, different roles. It should be available to everybody. If you are not in full-time employment at the moment, if you are working fewer than 35 hours, you should have the option to participate in the job guarantee. But it's an option. It should be compulsory for nobody. It's not work for the dull. It's not compulsory. Nobody's going to be forced to do it. There are, there's no reason to withdraw any income support or welfare payments which exist at the moment in order to introduce a job guarantee. And for reasons I haven't got time to go into now, I'm not a big fan of a UBI myself, but you could be in favour of a universal basic income and a job guarantee. They're not alternatives to each other. It must be not for profit. There would be no private sector involvement in the job guarantee. We'll mention how it might be organised in a minute before we finish, but and that's really important. Well, there are exceptions to everything. So you can imagine, particularly in remote communities, that as part of the job guarantee you might provide support for people setting up small cooperatives. Beyond that, there should be no private sector involved. It's not about paying private employers to take on cheap labor. The job guarantee should help to stabilise the economy. It should be a superior tool for stabilising the economy to anything we've had before because the economy is a very variable and uncertain place. It's difficult for economists to know what's happening in the economy at the moment, let alone what's going to happen in the next few months and to plan for it in advance. The job guarantee should help to stabilise the economy automatically without anybody fine-tuning anything. If there's a downturn, more people will walk into job guarantee offices and there'll be more spending by the government and the job guarantee just for the If the economy starts booming, then there'll be fewer people on the job guarantee and the government will automatically be spending less on the job guarantee program. So the job guarantee at the margin should set the level of the government's deficit. It should grow. If there's a downturn, when the private sector spends less, the government will be spending more on the job guarantee. It might be doing other things too, but this will happen automatically. The job guarantee should set the social wage. The legal minimum wage at the moment is, of course, not a legal minimum wage, because if you're not in employment, you're not going to be entitled <coughs> to it. Uh, I am in favour of somewhat increasing the legal minimum wage, because it has fallen behind... Uh, average wages and productivity relative to the equivalent if we were going back to the early 1970s or late 1960s. It should be a bit above $20 an hour, not a bit below $20 an hour if we were to move back towards that. Um, it should not replace the non-job guarantee sector. Even people working in the job guarantee as administrators. They're not part of the job guarantee themselves. They're conventional public sector workers. And the job guarantee, as far as is possible, should not, should not involve doing things which would otherwise have been done in the public sector or in the private sector. The job guarantee should nurture participants. We have an enormous amount of evidence, dozens of studies by psychologists and others, loads of statistical evidence based on panel data, looking at people's well-being over time, both their subjective well-being and their mental health and physical health as well, about the benefits for most people, not necessarily for you, but for most people on average, of having the opportunity to engage in paid employment. It's conclusive, really. There's not really any studies going in the other direction. And uh, there's a, a member of the Greens in Brisbane, who I've been talking to, is a psychologist, and when I say there's dozens of studies, he tells me there's hundreds. So we pretty much know that involuntary unemployment is bad for people in all sorts of things. It shouldn't be, unlike a scheme which was introduced in Argentina in the early 2000s and then unfortunately phased out, and it shouldn't have been, unlike the New Deal in the US, it shouldn't be 
a temporary crisis measure. Actually, the best time to introduce a job guarantee, in many ways, is when unemployment is not so high as it might have been at other points in our economic history, because it's easier to deal with the administration setting up. And it should involve making a positive contribution to our natural environment, or at least it should not involve engaging in activities which are damaging to our natural environment in our ecosystem. How much will it cost? And I'm tempted to say, who cares? We're not going to run out of dollars. It will cost however much it ought to cost for us to get to non-inflationary full employment. The right amount of money will be spent on the right people, in the right places, at the right time. But nonetheless, there have been econometric statistical studies done of the likely impact of the sort of job guarantee, sort of job guarantee we'd like to introduce. The best of them has been done in the US. And they tend to come up with estimates of the cost of the job guarantee of somewhere around 1% of GDP. If you were to think about it, that in Australia, in Australia, let's say 500,000 people, full-time equivalent, chose to participate in the job guarantee. Let's say each of them was being paid $40,000 a year. Let's say other costs added another 50% to the program. When you do the sum, you multiply those figures together and you compare them to GDP, it comes to a little bit more than 1.5% of GDP. But then some of that comes back in taxes, and these people will be spending money locally in shops, and that will stimulate other economic activity too. So you get it down to about the 1% value. But it wouldn't matter if it's 2 or 3%. Actually, at the moment, I think, our government budget is close to balance, and for a variety of reasons, the deficit should probably be 3 or 4% of GDP. So you could do the job guarantee, you could do lots of other things as well. Won't it cause inflation? No, in fact, what you're doing is you're taking an unemployed buffer stock of people. People who've been thrown on the scrap heap in order to discipline wage bargaining and keep inflation under control and you're replacing them with an employed buffer stock of people. Really, these people, if they keep their skills better, then if you want to think of them as competing with people in the workforce at the moment, they might even be more effective competition. And there'll be a more effective Commonwealth Employment Service. Let's reintroduce the Commonwealth Employment Service and get rid of all the private sector job active or job service providers. Um, <laughs> where will we find useful jobs? Well, just before I wrap up, we might deal with that one because Bill Mitchell, who I mentioned before, did some research about this years ago, and we discovered that we're not sure of ideas. Actually, there's loads of stuff to do. Won't it be a bureaucratic nightmare? We don't want to copy India's job guarantee, but India's job guarantee at the moment has about 50 million people. We're talking about maybe 500,000. We really ought to be able to the government does all sorts of complicated things. We would maybe need to rebuild some administrative capacity in the public sector, which really would be honest. And why not just pay everyone a universal basic income? If you want to make that argument, you can make that argument. I find it difficult to make that argument in a way which sets the UBI at a high enough level not to keep people in poverty and doesn't create inflation or changes in the tax system I don't think people would vote for. But that's not an argument I really want to have at the moment because as I said it's not an alternative, it's something else that you can talk about. They're not. It's not one or the other. You could have neither, which is what we've got at the moment, you could have both, or you could have one or, or the other. They're not alternatives to us. What about employers? Well, guess what? And all this is doing is giving everybody access to a minimum wage job. Employers have to pay, well, they ought to have to pay, the legal minimum wage at the moment anyway, but they're also going to have to give people decent working conditions because people will always have the opportunity of going down the job guarantee office. And what if those people then choose to stay permanently in the scheme? Right. Who cares? That will show you that the scheme is working. Well, people genuinely are 
doing things which they see as being useful and interesting and contributing to their, towards their well-being. That's not a problem at all. How can it be organised? Well, Bill's done work on this. Uh, I haven't. I'm not. I have no expertise whatsoever in their, this area, but I wouldn't imagine it be that complicated. We have a so-called Minister for Jobs at the moment. I prefer the term Minister for Employment, so let's change the name. Kelly O'Dwyer is the Minister for Jobs and various other things. Um, there was no good reason for getting rid of the Commonwealth Employment Service years ago when they did. What they replaced it with is much worse. Not that the Commonwealth Employment Service was all that great from the 1980s onwards, really. I think it got more and more punitive and less about helping people define employment. But we reintroduce it. Each capital city and each major regional city in Australia, like places like Newcastle where Bill is, would have Commonwealth employment offices. And then beneath them, in every local community, there'd be a, a you call it a local job bank, if you like, a job guarantee local office. And the job guarantee local office would have various government sectors. These are not private employers within them. So you might be working on environmental services. You might be uh, not planting trees, but it could be planting trees. So there's a variety of activities different in different parts of the country. You might be providing support to um, the elderly, helping them stay independent at home. Uh, I've long been before. You might be helping out in a library or a museum or an art gallery or maybe you might be a teaching assistant at school if, you were, if that was an appropriate thing for you to do. Um, you might be working on small scale infrastructural projects. We're not talking about 1930s style big building projects or anything. That's best done by those people that have the skills um, elsewhere in the economy. Or you might be, as was the case with the New Deal. Indeed, that little picture up the top there was, relates to people working in the Federal Art Project and the New Deal in the US in the 1930s. You can pay people to produce public art. You can provide them with support if they're early in their career as a writer while doing academic research. Hyman Minsky worked as a very young man in a New Deal project doing academic research in the 1930s. And um, there's a variety of activities. Now, to an extent, of course, how this works has to be laid down by the federal government, but there has to be scope at the local level for variations or for additions. And it's important that the job guarantee acts to stimulate the growth of local democracy and participation so that things that being done in the job guarantee reflect what the local community wants to be done in the job guarantee and of course it's important for there to be transparency and lots and lots of information about everything that's being done in the job guarantee has to be freely available online the whole time so that everybody can see the ways in which the job guarantee is contributing towards the local community. Now there are some problems related to all this, of course there are, but they're not problems that we can't overcome. I'd like to see full employment as a legal obligation. If they can't offer you a place in the job guarantee, in the job guarantee scheme, unless, you know, for disciplinary reasons, you've been warned a number of times and then suspended and then finally thrown out the program, I'd have a guaranteed minimum income for you under those circumstances, even then. But um, apart from under those circumstances, you should be able to sue the government if you're on it. Because it's the government's responsibility to make sure that you're it. About 10 years ago, Bill's Centre on Full Employment and Equity at the University of Newcastle did a survey of employees in well, they tried to contact people in 50% of local authorities in Australia, they got a 50% response rate, so they actually spoke to people in 25% of local authorities in Australia. And they said, if 
Budget wasn't an issue. What range of activities could you usefully employ people to do in your local communities? And this isn't a complete list. So there were lots of ideas. We're not sure of ideas. We're not sure of things that need doing. People seem to think that we're going to run out of jobs to do. There'll be nothing to do in the future. We'll have to sit on our bottoms all day and just consume because there'll be robots. Well, sod that thing. If we're going to run out of things that we can do for each other, and if we're going to run out of things that we can dignify as being worthy of remuneration from the community when people contribute towards the community, then you have to wonder what the point of life is. What about further education and training? Once you've been <coughs> in the job guarantee for a while, you should be given the opportunity to participate in this, and what's available should depend of course on the needs of the local community and that's where you've got, uh, 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 you've got to communicate with local employers and find out what the skill shortages are. But if you don't want to do it, the job guarantee is about taking you as you are and finding a job for you to do as you are. If you don't want to train, if you want to stay exactly as you are, that's fine. But the job guarantee, there'll be plenty of relatively unskilled activities that you can engage in. And of course, this, none of this means that you can't have proper income support for people who can't participate. For one reason. You're not taking anything away from anyone. You're just giving people an opportunity. That's the idea. So, we're almost at the end of the graduate to know and maybe you want to find out more because even I've been whittering old for ages now but um, even uh, with a relatively long talk like this I can only really just quickly skim over these issues if you want to find out more about modern monetary theory which underlies a lot of what I've been talking about then there are lots of books you could look at including mine but you have to pay for those, there is a better, as far as MMT is concerned, absolutely free book. Warren Mosler is not only a very good economist, but also was a very successful fund manager and business person, and is a multi-millionaire, and so doesn't mind giving his books away for free. <laughs> so, there is a book called The Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy, which is an excellent introduction modern monetary theory from a Wall Street insider, a Federal Reserve insider. If you read that book, you'll see described discussions Warren Mosler had with leading uh, American famous economists, but also, um, also uh, famous politicians in the US. Um, I'm having an Al Gore at a senior moment there for me. There's a chat Warren had with Al Gore, which is discussed in that book. Um, and what did Al Gore do? This was an event uh, uh, money to raise money for his presidential campaign when he was standing against George Bush. And Al Gore turned around to Warren and said, because well, Bill Clinton had just created a budget surplus, so how do you suppose I should spend the budget surplus when I'm elected? And Warren said, you're not going to have a budget. The economy is going to Budget surfaces, weaken private balance sheets, this is unsustainable. And they had a nice chat over dinner. And by the end of the chat, Warren was convinced Al Gore thoroughly understood modern money. And then Al Gore stood up and did it after dinner speech, and it was about how he was going to spend So, anyway, there's lots of stories like that, and a great discussion of the basics of modern monetary theory. And you could just do a search for. Warren Posner, Seven Deadly, from Google, and you'll find the three books there. It's about 70, 80 pages long. It's not really long. You could also send me an email. I, I don't mind. 
and depending on what you're interested in, and depending maybe on how much you feel you know at the moment, I can send you all sorts of things, or links to all sorts of things. There's loads of videos we can to. We are on the brink. I said think big at the beginning, or I quoted Bernie saying think big at the beginning. In the last week, there have been articles in The Economist magazine, very far right wing economics publication, The Financial Times, everywhere, about modern monetary theory. More than half the declared presidential candidates from the Democrats in the US are committed to a job guarantee. In this country, I have reason to believe that there are leading politicians, maybe not the leaders, but leading politicians in the Australian Labour Party and the Australian Greens who would like to introduce a job guarantee. And believe me, five years ago there is no way that a G8 university like the University of Adelaide would invite Professor Stephanie Kelton to come and be a big hardcore lecture, which is going to happen in other way this year. So in a variety of ways, I think we're on the verge of winning. Um, the last domino to fall, as everybody else, I think we're on the verge of winning. Uh, I'm going to do a really short talk uh, at, at the university on the 4th of March, and I'm going to have um, um, the chief executive of Shelter SA um, talk about homelessness in South Australia, and Australia generally, and the, <coughs> path, the policies of the parties and how they made an impact on homelessness after the federal election. And I also hope there'll be a talk of a talk of speaker from the anti poverty network. Who might talk about the UBI if she wants to? It'd be up to her on that as well. So it would be great um, to see you if you could uh, get along on the 5th of March. And um, that's it, Lou. Thanks very much for your patience. And we look forward to you. Stephen Howell for coming. So what we're going to do now is do a quick Q&A and because I'm running the session, I dictate, so I go first. My question to you, I'll... now when I went to the Adelaide Uni Labour Market Research Workshop, which is hosted by the Department of Jobs and Small Business, I talked to a lot of uh, conservative economists, I'll be from that, and one of the big things they talked about with me is that they have concerns about the job guarantee and concerns about one monetary theory, concerns about um, essentially trying to find public sector jobs for the unemployed because they believe in the non accelerating inflationary rate of unemployment. Uh, that's the idea that there is a natural rate of unemployment and that is 5%. That is for the point. Well, that, they call it 5% then. They would have called it about 8% a few years ago. And then between the two, it's been three or four percent or something between. Like so it tends to be. Um, what you're just talking about, I, I sort of mentioned right at the very beginning when I said that the right took over the economic profession in the late 1970s. And well, I go over it in detail in my book. It's not, it's, it's not I, I don't want to give you a history of, uh, otherwise, it would be a long time of uh, economics stretching back down the decades, but uh, basically they redefined full employment to be whatever the rate of unemployment has been recently. And uh, built on a theory which in one form or another had been around for many years, but which was popularised by an economist called Milton Friedman from the late 1960s onwards. And that theory was that uh, given um, the alternatives unemployed workers have in terms of uh, whether they can easily claim benefits and given how disruptive trade unions are in terms of preventing uh, businesses uh, introducing, uh, uh, introducing new ways of boosting productivity and issues like that. Given all those issues, at any point in time, there will be a level of recorded unemployment where if you go below that level of recorded unemployment, Inevitably, there'll be um, the, an imbalance of bargaining power in the labour market, 
and demands from workers will drive up labour costs faster and inflation. And you call that the natural rate of unemployment or the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Now, uh, no, no two economists or no two models will give you the same thing for the natural rate of unemployment. Not only that, the natural rate of unemployment, if we were to go back over the last 50 years, has been anywhere between about 2% and about 8% in countries like Australia. So the natural rate of unemployment, it doesn't even exist. There have been big movements in unemployment over time in this country with little or no impact on the inflation rate. Sure, if we tried to use an old-fashioned 1960s style Keynesian stimulus package of lots of government spending and all sorts of things to try and deliberately push unemployment down to 1%, that would be liable to create inflation because there'd be shortages of skilled labour in different parts of the economy and you'd get other bottlenecks as well. But of course that's not what we're talking about doing at all. We're not talking about unfocused spending in order to try and boost the economy to absorb labour, uh, which is all sorts of problems. That one problem is the people that benefit from that are generally people who've got jobs already. Or the people who get jobs that haven't are the ones that are in the best position to do so. It doesn't really help a disadvantage. They're not the ones that end up being absorbed by a plenty of stimulus like that. Now, instead, what we are aiming to do is to spend consistent with paying people minimum wage and giving them good working conditions to spend the minimum amount to get to full employment, spending it in the right places, the right parts of the country, so that people, if you live in a rural community and there aren't any job opportunities, you'll be able to stay. And you'll have some money to spend on a shop, so other people will be able to stay too. Everyone won't have to move to the other. And so if you're spending the right amount of money in the right places, the right people, at the right time, to get to full employment. Another way of looking at it, which Bill sometimes uses, is that we're replacing the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment with something which he sometimes calls the non-accelerating inflation buffer employment ratio. By that he means that if we need to slow down the economy because there's too much spending and inflation is picking up, we can still do that, but now we're not consigning people to the scrap. If some people lose their jobs in the private sector as a consequence of a squeeze, they will always have the opportunity of working at the minimum wage in the job guarantee scheme. Um, so it's, it's a different way of managing. Awesome. Who's got a question? Uh, uh, we'll go with Anthony first. Thank you. Well, that's two questions. <laughs> we'll leave them to one for that now. That depends on whether they're easy questions. <laughs> okay. Two questions were one. At the actual local, individual, personal level, mm -hmm. are people involved in this? How do we ensure that people are actually using their actual skills and knowledge and what they can actually do in terms of you know, doing things because they need to be done? But they're not you know, satisfactory in top jobs, you know what I mean, but a personal level. And also, my second question was, is there any, in the real world, is there any realistic chance well, let me answer the second question first. I can't be too specific because I've been breaching confidence, but there's a very good chance that both of them, really? let's not say both of the major parties, two of the three major parties are actively considering <laughs> job guarantees at the moment. Uh, one of the leaders of those parties, I've even been told, has read my book. Um, but, I'm not that bad. But, I mean, that's how I know it. He's asked for more information about a job guarantee that might, might operate uh, in Australia. Um, the other question, um, let's be realistic. If, you are, if you're an architect or something and you lose your job, I can't promise you a job as an architect. But if you've got skills like that which are insured, you can't find another job pretty quickly. And probably not one of the people who really needs the job guarantee to be in place. What I can promise you is a variety 
of interesting things and worthwhile things in the community that you could be doing. If I lose my job as an economist, I'm not necessarily going to expect a job guarantee to um, employ me to do economics. Um, it's possible. Heinrich Minsky, as I said, did do some economics research as part of the UD, but I'm not necessarily going to expect it. Uh, I'd be happy in those circumstances for a while to uh, do some work trying to uh, improve the natural environment locally. Uh, I'd love to get paid to do that if I lost my current job. I'd be happy to participate in improving my local community in that way. I'd be happy to um, help some, uh, we're not talking about nursing, but helping people who are. Uh, uh, who uh, are reasonably independent, but could do with some help around the place, or help with shopping, or just some company. I'd be happy to do that. I'd be happy to go and help out in the school as a teacher's assistant. So I'd be happy to help out uh, as an assistant to the librarians in my local library. I'd be happy to do a variety of tasks. So no, I can't guarantee that you will use your precise skills in the job guarantee. Some people may be able to do so, but you can't guarantee it. That's not really what it's there for. It's there for people who have lost their job, they feel lost in a sense of purpose, um, they perhaps are often reduced to poverty. Because even if you're entitled to take to, to, to new start, that's, that's not enough. And we're near enough. So in a job guarantee, you're going to earn more than twice as much as that. And you are going to earn. You're going to feel you're going to earn. And with the local community involved, and what you're doing is seen as a useful thing within the local community, then the idea is that it's respected enough so that you might just choose to stay in that room. You might choose not to go to what you did before. So yes, I think it might happen. I think it will happen at some stage. Um, and uh, I have a lot of stories. You mentioned briefly about India and the job guarantee there. I'm not quite familiar about it. Could you please just give an outline of what they've implemented there and maybe some of the benefits and, and negatives of the program which would, could be applicable to any Australian situation? Uh, okay. There, there's, there's, Obviously in India it's very different to here. There's uh, something called the Mah Mahatma, I'm going to get the name right, the Mahatma Gandhi Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which was introduced, I think in 2005, and which guarantees at least, least guaranteed one member of each family up to 100 days of employment at the minimum wage a year. Uh, it started off as purely people working on manager schemes, that sort of thing, but there are now a wide variety of activities that people can participate in, including um, the sort of activities that I was talking about before, um, which you might know, regard as sort of central care activities rather than just caring for the room. Um, it's been widely praised for a variety of reasons. Well, um, one thing is that it's, it's always been very difficult to get money out of the Indian bureaucracy. And some people who are very keen on the scheme say when people have done the work in the, as part of the rule of job guarantee, they're much more determined to make sure they, they get the money. They'll, they'll protest, they'll queue up, they'll wait, and they'll make sure they get, they, they get their reviews. And on the downside, it's a huge scheme, the administrative difficulties there. Early on, there were problems with corruption. They have been greatly diminished by the publication of enormous amounts of information on the internet about how the schemes work and what's been done and the precise amount of money that's been spent. There are issues in some parts of the country with not everybody who should be entitled to a place on the scheme being found a place on the scheme. This has got much worse in recent years because the Modi government, when it was elected, wanted to scrap the scheme. 
they were unable to scrap the scheme because it was too popular. That's what I expect would happen in Australia. A bit like they used to say in the UK with the National Health Service, Margaret Thatcher used to say something like this, it was so, so popular that even if they wanted to scrap it, they couldn't do it. It's just impossible. Um, but what they've been doing instead is they've been starving it for funds. It's important that the job guarantee is budgeted per job, not with a limit to the total amount you can spend on the job guarantee. If there is such a limit, you will reach a point where you can't take any more participants in the program. And in some states in India, I believe that's been a problem. I can't say I'm an expert in the matter of job guarantee. Another big job guarantee scheme was the Plan HFS scheme in Argentina, which was introduced after their crisis in 2002, and which at one stage included 2 million people within it, and was a very successful scheme. Indeed, it didn't create inflation, it did help to reduce uh, poverty, particularly rural poverty. But um, across the 2000s, things have changed now, but across the 2000s, up to the financial crisis anyway, the Argentine economy grew faster than almost any economy around the world. And by 2005, 2006, the crisis was basically over. And the politicians, particularly because they were encouraged to do so, I believe, by uh, the Catholic Church, amongst others, uh, scrapped the scheme. Because 70% of the participants in the scheme were women, and in rural communities it was changing. The opportunities people were having was changing the role of women in society in ways that the patriarchy didn't approve of. So in 2005 and 2006, they scrapped that scheme and they went to uh, basic income payments. Those are the two schemes which have the most in common, albeit not huge amount, with the job guarantee scheme that we'd like to introduce in Australia. Lots of other government job creation projects around the world, including in Australia. Alright, next question. Um, let's go. Um, uh, Jake. I've struggled so hard to explain because I saw your video, I think it was here. It was in this very room. Yeah, they did. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. a deja vu. When I first saw it, I sat there and I almost had a little bit of a tear because I realised everything I'd known about it once was a bit bullshit. And then I <laughs> Me <read> too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I, I, I have not always thought the way I think now. I've been teaching economics for over 30 years. For the first 20 of those years, nearly, I was teaching. I don't use the word, but I could use the same word. I've tried to explain it to some people, and the main one I've come to find is that most people inherently can't understand it because they've been lied to about it for so long and there's so much misinformation. My favourite one is my taxes pay for things. Um, that one really is hard to get through to a lot of people because they feel like it's a fundamental right. If they pay taxes, they have a right to decide what goes on in the country. They go, no, there's different reasons you should have a right to say things because your taxes are not one of them. And people lose their blood debt. Because when you tell people that their taxation dollars just get to lead out the system, it's an anti-inflationary measure, they can't handle it. How do you get past that point of view? Because most people just shut me down there and go, I don't agree. Well, you can tell them if you like. In some ways they're right. If they pay their taxes to the state government, then their taxes do pay for things. Yep. It's just that the federal government is in a different position to everybody else. Um, it's right to be compassionate. It's right to remember when you didn't understand this either. It's, it's good to start a conversation sometimes, as I did when four and a half years ago I did the talk, Phil was sitting over there at the time. Uh, it's, it's good to start a conversation by saying, I didn't also understand this myself. So if you struggle with these ideas, I can quite understand where you're coming from, that's perfectly all right. But everything I'm going to tell you is just a fact. Yeah. Uh, and then really, you can't persuade somebody to change their mind. They tend to have an emotional reaction. If they've got a way of looking at the world which they're very attached to, they become defensive. But you can just plant a seed in their head. And maybe a month later, maybe three months later. It's like my dad two years. <laughs> well, all right, I'm going to make a confession here. Philip, who is sitting 
in the second row is the first person to talk to me about modern monetary theory when I was an orthodox economist. And he tells me, and I can't, I can't remember, so there's no wrong, but he tells me that I laughed. But I don't laugh at it anymore. I laugh at I just I cannot remember what I was thinking. And um, when you talk to people who are academic economists about this, you do get that reaction sometimes. I have had a reaction, I stress not from anyone in our university, but from a well-known economist who had worked in a central bank. I have discussed these ideas with a person of that kind not all that long ago, and he closed his eyes and he put his fingers in his ears he said, I don't want to listen to any of this. I'm just trying to get through to the team. <laughs> <laughs> we might take three more questions and wrap up the team to the copyright. So, are you hanging out quite well? Yeah? Okay. yeah um, I fully agree with the principle of the deficit standing is a really necessary thing. But on the subject of the risk of inflation and the right of inflation, which would probably destroy the credibility of this sort of policy for a couple of generations, it will become very important to be able to achieve the point of which we can spend too much. Do you have any thoughts on how we will actually work out where that point is and how far we can go before we break the door to inflation? Uh, I do. It's very important that modern monetary theory is not seen as an invitation for limitless government spending because it isn't. I sometimes think that when I'm going through those three axioms we sometimes call them that I had on a slide up there, before I talk about the federal government having no purely financial constraint, I ought to put the second point first and say that every society has real constraints related to the productive capacity. And I, I ought to say that there has been no case of hyperinflation of which I'm aware, historically, where the initial causes have not come from the supply side of the economy. So the Zimbabwean hyperinflation was not initially caused by the Zimbabwean government printing too much money. It was caused by, amongst other things, but this was the main cause, it was caused by in an agrarian economy for entirely understandable reasons relating to land reform taking history into account. The Zimbabwean government basically evicted all the productive farmers from the land and gave the land to people, not even to people that used to work, but gave the land to people with no interest in or expertise. When it replied from Zimbabwe, they basically just stopped creating food. Now, Zimbabwe did not have good uh, relations with high-income countries and had no way of importing food. So basically, the country had no food, more or less over and over, let's say, within a season. Now, what happened after that? Of course, prices started to rise. In order to feed people in his political party and in the bureaucracy in the army, the Zimbabwean president started printing money. And if you print money to buy things that don't exist, you will create market inflation. In Germany, in 1923, that's the other occasion people talk about a lot. And we can do more modern ones if you like, but the Venezuela story is a lot. So maybe I might avoid that one. Germany, 1923. Germany just fought the First World War. Germany had surrendered at the end of the First World War. Basically, partly, there was semi famine. Um, Germany's productive regions had been taken away from Germany and given to France and Germany had been given enormous reparations which it was going to have to pay for years and years and years in gold to the rest of the world. The only way for Germany to buy that gold was to pay for it in marks. And there was nothing to buy. That's another way to get hyperinflation. You get hyperinflation if you fight the First World War with the news. You get hyperinflation if you shoot all the farms. If we were to do either of those two things in Australia, we'd get hyperinflation. I don't need to be facetious, but those are the occasions that people usually refer to 
almost always, with no knowledge at all of the historical circumstances. When people talk about these things in the mind, like me, they generally haven't ever bothered to look back to see what the causes are. That having been said, we don't want to create inflation. There's no reason to change the target for inflation from 2 to 3%. I'm quite happy with that target. There's no scientific basis for it, no particular reason to change it. It's low enough so that people don't notice it. So it seems to be fair enough as far as, as far as I'm concerned. So when it comes to looking at the impact of a job guarantee on inflation, what we do is we try to use um, not the same ones that the uh, neoliberals on the right use, but we try to use the best econometric forecasting that we can to simulate economic prices. And that's the way that Bernie's job guarantee in the US has been looked at. And it's also the way in which his scheme for uh, making a public college education tuition free and, and uh, um, uh, forgiving student debt has been looked at. Basically, they've taken estimates and they've plugged them into the economic model, and there's minimal predicted impact on inflation based on that economic model. Now, these models are just toys, it doesn't mean things are going to turn out like that in practice. If inflation was to pick up, well, we have a variety of tools, some of which we use at the moment and some of which we don't, which we could use in order to limit inflation. But the point is, if you've got a job guarantee in place, if you have to slow the economy down because inflation is becoming a problem, then you're not pushing people into unemployment. You're pushing them into the job guarantee. Yeah, that's the idea. Do you have a question for me? Yeah. Um, a term I think get thrown around a lot, particularly in Southern Europe, is government debt. Um, after hearing all the stuff about like government um, deficit and surplus, how exactly does government debt work? Because I feel like there's not a lot of good public understanding around the concept. Are you talking about strategy? You talk about Southern Europe. Well, um, keep it to Australia for relevance. Well, no, it's, we really, uh, it's best not to keep it to Australia because Southern Europe is in a completely different position to Australia. If you are the Spanish government or the Italian government or the Greek government or the Portuguese government, you have more in common with me than you do with the Australian government because you're not a currency issue. You use what is effectively a foreign currency. If you are the Spanish government, um, if you are deficit spending, then you have to issue government bonds in order to raise money. If there's any, if, if, if there's any uh, perceived risk out there that you might at any point default on those bonds, then that default, if the European Central Bank doesn't choose to come along and support you, and that default becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because as soon as you become, it looks like you need to be defaulted, lenders require you to pay such a high rate of interest on your debt that default becomes an inevitability. And if you're the Spanish government, you know, you've got so much power that you can pick up the phone and ring the president of the European Central Bank, but he won't be You're not important. Um, no, that's not just the Spanish government, it's, it's uh, a whole series of governments in the Eurozone. Now, they did basically, more or less, cast Greece into, uh, well, I'm not going to use too descriptive language, they, they insisted on the Greek government employing such austerity, run such large operating services, make such cuts that the Greek economy and Greek society will never recover. They've lost an entire generation of control and never be the same as it would have been. And when the threat came that the other countries across southern Europe would be in a similar position to Greece and that even this could stretch to France, the European Central Bank in 2012 broke its own rules and said, we're not supposed to support and as soon as the European Central Bank at the time said if nobody else wants to buy Spanish government debt, we'll buy it. 
they didn't actually have to follow through because the interest rate on the Spanish government debt went all the way down to the same level as well, the general government debt overnight. Just because the European Central Bank can't run out of euros, it's the one institution that can't. If they say they'll fund the Spanish government or the Portuguese government or the Italian government, then um, those governments are not going to go into default. But there is something called the fiscal compact. There are some rules that those governments are required to follow on an ongoing basis in order to qualify for that support. And the Italian government has been is operating outside those rules at the moment, so there is um, potential risk with the Italian government of insolvency. What do I think about the euro? Uh, it is the first serious experiment in monetary history, and we have over 5,000 years of monetary history where a currency has been launched with a central bank behind it but without a powerful central government behind it. It's never happened before. There's probably a good reason for it. Before it doesn't work. And the Eurozone, next time there's a global financial crisis, is going to have a similar set of circumstances to deal with them. Because they haven't introduced the necessary reforms to make it work. Basically, it is my view that for the European currency to survive and prosper in the long run, Europe has to become federal and have a strong federal government somewhere, which will be the currency issue of central government, which will be able to spend in Greece or in Spain or in Italy or in Portugal if necessary, and will be able to raise taxes where necessary. If they don't do that, I, I don't have a lot of Just before the last question, there, there are two good books there. There's one by Bill Mitchell on the Eurozone disaster. Eurozone dystopia. Dystopia. Oh, yeah. okay. Billy Bob will be ashamed of me. <laughs> and there's another one from a uh, sort of internal thing about what happened in Greece and atmosphere of Marcus. about that. So that's, yeah, that's right. Um, now, our last question. You've been here for quite a while, so that's right. Uh, so just a general MMT question. Um, some of the um, deficit doubts will say, uh, yes, you can run perpetual deficits, but you shouldn't increase your debt to GDP ratio or that can get too high or something. So I was just wondering, is that clear rubbish? Yes. <laughs> that's it. The, the, the country with the highest debt to GDP ratio in the world is Japan. Do you know, or can you guess, the rate of interest on 10-year Japanese government debt? That's right, it's zero. It's zero because a couple of years ago the Bank of Japan decided to do it. And they decided they'd buy back all the government debt if necessary until there was a zero year or ten year Japanese government debt. Um, all this deficit spending in Japan, um, well, it's kept on employment money. They've got a lower unemployment rate than us, actually. But it's not created any inflation. In fact, they've been struggling for years and years to record falling taxes. Um, you can't interpret any fiscal balance, which is the amount the government, if it considers a deficit, borrows this year, or any level of government debt as being good or bad taken out of context of the economy as a whole. You have to judge it in the context of inflation and the level of unemployment and a variety of other factors. So there'll be occasions when it's right to have a budget deficit of 3%. There'll be occasions when it might be right, as the US did in 2009, to have a government budget deficit of nearly 10%. There'll be occasions, rarely, when it might be right to have a government budget surplus, but you have to interpret it in the context of the economy. All right, I want to bring us on one more time to give a big clap for Stephen Howe.